Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the mentoring hour. Um, it's good to see all of you. Um, this is a time that we uh, take time to answer questions, answer doubts, share testimonies. So welcome uh, this morning. Uh, we could we could start with a word of prayer. And uh, may I request uh, any one of the students to start with a word of prayer? John, would you like to start with a word of prayer? Yeah, sure. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Lord, we submit ourselves into your hands as we come before your presence for this time of mentoring our Lord. We pray that we would be able to clarify our doubts uh, before your presence and pray, O oh God, uh, for all the faculties that you would anoint them with your word uh, and we would be satisfied with your knowledge and your wisdom through them, Lord. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you. So welcome once again. Uh, this is a time that we uh, take to discuss or bring up questions that we may have in um, something that we've learned or something that you've had in your own personal study, uh, anything to do with ministry, with Christian life, or any topic that you feel can be addressed here. We have uh, all our faculty here. Um, and we will take time uh, to address your questions. So you could either put your questions up on the chat or you could quickly unmute and uh, give us your question and we'll do our best to uh, answer these. So it's open for questions. Uh, you could take, uh, you could go ahead and post your questions. Yeah, this is Jaya. I, Hi, I am a student of your e-learn portal. Welcome, uh, Jaya. Welcome. Yeah. For the first time I've joined, I had some questions in mind regarding Matthew chapter 13. It talks about uh, good seed and weed. It talks about good fish and bad fish. So my question is, what about the weeds and what about the bad fish? Because what God is saying that till uh, at the end of age, they will be judged and all. So till the end of age, I think they have hope. We can still pray for such weeds and bad fish, right? Or what God wants to say here, what are the weeds? Who are the weeds? Who are the bad fish? Okay. Thank you, Jaya. I, Jaya, you've made reference to um, the parable of the weeds that's found in Matthew 13, 24 onwards. Am I right? Yes. Is yes. that what your reference yes. is? Okay. Yes. Uh, and uh, your question is, um, I think you have a couple of questions. The first question that you had was, um, uh, who are the weeds? Um, mm -hmm. And and what does that mean? And what happens? Does it mean that there will be judgment on the weeds uh, till the last day? Wouldn't they have the opportunity to to repent and yes. uh, come back? Is that is yes. your question? Yes. Yes. Right? right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jaya, for the question. Uh, I'm opening this up to our faculty. If anybody um, would kindly take up this question and uh, address Jaya, please. Any of our faculty? Pastor Nancy or Pastor Paul? Uh, hi, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jean, and thank you, Jaya, for that question. Uh, so, Jaya, uh, the question that you've asked is that, um, you know, if there would there is time for uh, the tears and uh, I think you were also referring to the parable of the uh, uh, dragnet which is from uh, verse 47 in Matthew uh, 13. Uh, so the question you're asking is whether there is opportunity for uh, the tears to change or you know those who are not God's people to uh, change isn't it? Yes yes. Okay 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 okay. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, as we see, uh, Jaya, the Lord Jesus has died for uh, all of mankind and uh, anyone, you know, who accepts him, anyone who receives him, uh, they, they, they have the opportunity to, I mean, they change because uh, of uh, salvation, you know, which they have received. So um, uh, yes, I think my answer would be yes there is opportunity to change and uh, in both of these parables itself like you can see that there is a time at which you know god um, uh, puts an end to uh, life here on earth and that's the time of that's the time when um, you know judgment will will begin so till such time yes there is an opportunity for people to come to know the lord so uh, that's that would be my answer i think uh, maybe the others could uh, add to it or correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Um, anybody else, Pastor Ashish? Would you like to add anything, Pastor? Um, yeah, I think pretty much, uh, you know, I agree with what Nancy already said. So basically, uh, you know, in both these parables, the Lord is just showing us that there are going to be two groups of people, those who are saved and those who are unsaved. And of course, uh, till, the, till their last moment, every unsaved person has the opportunity to turn to the Lord. But the and final separation between the saved and the unsaved. Uh, he's just using pictures, you know, uh, whether it's uh, the weeds and the tears or the dragnet, the fish, to just show us, you know, help us understand this uh, separation that is going to happen. And uh, yeah, and so then we know, and when you read in Revelation 20, the last few verses, uh, there is that final uh, great white throne judgment when, you know, we will all be separated. Uh, and so that's, so I agree with what, you know, what Nancy has said, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Jaya. Thank you for that question and welcome. So good to have you here. And thank um, you. Yeah, we have another question, uh, rather two questions from John. Um, so uh, he's brought about two references. The first one is 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 41. Uh, I think I'll just read that and also post it here. Um, So uh, it reads, reads uh, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from one another star in glory. And John's question is, does this mean that there could be differences in the glory that we possess when we reach heaven. Okay. Um, would anybody like to take up that question? Yeah, I think uh, the answer is we just have to read verse 42. So, John, if you read verse 42, um, it tells us what the comparison is. So, sure, I'll, I'll just read it. I want the other reference. Sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I can read that for you. So, it's verse 42 sure, sure, sure. says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in, in corruption. Yeah. So, uh, what he's comparing is the natural and the spiritual, the corruptible body which we live in and the incorruptible body which we receive. So he's not talking about different glories in heaven, but he's just doing a simple comparison between uh, the physical body and the spiritual body. Okay, boss, yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, John. Uh, the second question that he's put up is on Daniel 12.2. Um, I'll just read that verse again. And many of those who sleep, 
Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So John's question is, the shame mentioned in this verse, is that among believers after resurrection or unbelievers as a whole? Um, would somebody like to take up that question? Um, yeah, so again here, the answer is, um, it's in the verse itself, Daniel 12 verse 2, he's just talking about people dying, right? So the context is many. Uh, the context is not uh, specifically believers, but many. So many will die, That's lots of people will die. And which we know uh, is ha has been happening uh, since the beginning of time. And some will rise to eternal life, so being saved, and some will be to eternal things. So the, the, the answer is in the beginning of the verse. The verse says, many will die. So it's, it's inclusive. Basically, it's all people who will die. And then some rise to one side of light and some to uh, shame. Thanks, Master. Uh, the reason I asked was I heard some sermons uh, saying the other way. So I was just mm -hmm. wondering. So uh, what I heard was, you know, when you even when you go to heaven, uh, you, you know, if you are not fully sanctified, uh, there would be differences in the glory so that you will be ashamed looking at the other person. They have more glory. So these were the two scriptures that they took uh, to prove it. So I just want to get some clarity on that. Yeah, thanks, Master. Mm. So I think when you look at the first passage, I mean, if somebody if somebody had preached a message using verses 40 and 40, uh, preached the message that you said, you know, using verse 40 and 41, uh, I think it's a classic example of not reading the whole context. You know, it's a good it's an example of how uh, we can preach something that's not biblical using scriptures by taking something out of context. So verse 40 and 41, the context is verse 42, or actually the whole you know, thing. He's talking about uh, uh, body and the resurrection, right? So what, you know, whoever was preaching that sermon, they took these two verses out of context and preached a me message. So uh, you know, then they, they could just say anything you want. So that's just a good, a good example of bad preaching. You know, it's something we should never do. And uh, same thing in Daniel 12 too, you know, the, it's just clear that, and, and how do we interpret Daniel 12 too? We should interpret it in the light of the rest of scripture. What does the rest of scripture teach us? You know, that uh, like, you know, we, we saw Matthew 13 and just so many other places where uh, every person, every person, uh, you know, is going to be raised up and then separated. So the context of Daniel 12 too also is, uh, Again, when that same message was uh, misused, but these are—it's good that you observe it, so they, they become examples for us on how not to preach the word of God. Yeah, thanks, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, John. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, John. So that's a, a good reminder for us uh, to be careful of not taking things out of context. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're open for uh, questions. Um, so you're free to add in your question. Um, okay, Abni has put in a question. Um, Hebrews 11, 39, 40, 39 to 40. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us, would they be made perfect? I need some light on verse 40, especially. Uh, Avni, uh, is there something specific that you would like to bring about? Uh, good morning, ma'am. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, it says that only together with us would they be made perfect. So just wanted to understand what exactly does it mean like Okay, you're looking for who the they is in the context. And what does it mean that 
only without made. us they would be made perfect so what does it exactly mean ma'am that's what i wanted to know okay all right so only together with us would they be made perfect um yes i'm opening the question up for a faculty to respond uh, okay thank you uh, avni for that question ji can i go ahead Yes, please, please. Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you, thank you, Jean. Uh, so, um, uh, Avni, my understanding is that uh, you know there are some promises, you know, that uh, don't just involve one individual, but it could involve uh, people uh, intergenerationally. It could involve people across generations for example uh, you know even taking abraham for that matter there was uh, i mean god said so many things um, uh, to him he, he made you know several promises and uh, one of which was that you know he would he would have a son but then we also know that god said he would give uh, give him uh, land he would um, bless him with descendants and they that they would fill the earth so the thing is like abraham um yes he saw the birth of isaac but then when you think about his descendants and the possession of the land which god was to give him that would happen later so uh, in a in a sense what even though you know it says that uh, along with us they will be made perfect uh, what it means is that there is there is involvement of uh, others also in the fulfillment of that uh, whole promise if i can call it that god has made to an individual person so that's that's what uh, you know um uh, it means uh, it it doesn't mean that you know in some way we are going to be made perfect or you know complete uh, so that that is not the interpretation but basically the fulfillment of god's promise involves uh, involves uh, several people and uh, yes there could be some like for example even you could take abraham in, uh, earlier in that passage you see that he lived in tents you know isaac lived in tents so they did not really uh, he did not really possess the land the way god had promised him in his lifetime but yes you know things began to unfold from then on so uh, yeah that that uh, would be my understanding and i think i will leave it at that if somebody else could also add to this thank you thank you pastor nancy um uh, anybody else would like to add in uh, any further insights yes pastor yeah yeah so um thanks nancy for sharing that um so uh if you when we you know so again here we have to look at the context so he's summing up two things in verses 39 and 40 but the context is in the verses before uh so in hebrews 11 uh, one of the things he talks about all these heroes of faith especially as he points to abraham is he says that they were looking for a city whose builder and maker was god right so you see this in um, hebrews 11 verse 16 uh, and then uh, he, if you back up again in hebrews 11 13 he talks about um, they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth but they were looking forward to what they were looking to a city um uh, was again then you back up and you read verse 10 a city whose builder and maker is god so uh so the context and it's repeated several times in hebrews 11 verse 10 verse 13 was uh was 16 uh he's repeating the same thing he's saying you know these people of faith they all did what they had to do in their lifetime but they were looking for something ahead and what were they looking for a city whose builder and maker is god right uh that was what they were looking for and that's something they did not receive in their lifetime so abraham received his promise which was the land of canaan but he did, he was not looking just for a land of, the land of canaan he was looking for a heavenly country he was looking for a city whose builder and maker is god uh he's you know and all these people they lived as pilgrims on the earth so you see this repeated many times verse 10 verse 13 verse 16 so that's the context and so when the writer concludes he's saying look they didn't receive that city in their lifetime why because god wanted 
everybody, the Old Testament saints, as well as the New Testament saints, received that at the same time. So that's what he's summing up in verses 39 and 40, right? So he says, they all obtained a good testament through their faith. That means, you know, they, they did what they had to do through faith, verse 39, right? They had a good report. God says, well done. I'm giving you 100 on 100. You did what you had to do in your lifetime. But the thing that you were looking for, which is the city whose builder and maker is God, you were, you know, a, a, a found, you know a, an eternal city. That Old Testament and New Testament saints are going to enter into together. So that's what he is uh, speaking of here, that God having provided something better for us, uh, that they should not be made perfect um, apart from them. Right. So this is something also we've mentioned in, in our course on the end times when we, you know, and if you go back to the course notes, you will see it there uh, as one of the reasons why we believe that Old Testament saints will be part of the rapture. Uh, it's in your course notes. Uh, we say we quote this Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. We, we mentioned these verses saying that because we, the reason we can say Old Testament saints will be part of the New Testament saints in the rapture is because God said, you know, we will together enter into what he has prepared, right? So when the rapture takes place, he will come with him, right? And then we also mentioned at the end of the seven-year tribulation, when the Lord Jesus comes from heaven, whom will he cometh? He'll come with thousands and ten thousands of his saints. So the saints are ushered into the millennium. Who are the saints? Old Testament and New Testament. We're entering in together into what God has prepared. So if you look at the context, we will know what, you know, what, what he's talking about. I, I hope that helps. Uh, everything Nancy said is, is, is uh, I agree with, but I'm just explaining Hebrews 11, 39 to 40 in its context. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Abni, I trust yeah, that answers yes, your ma question. Yes, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yes, uh, open again for questions. Anybody would like to bring in questions, please feel free to do so. The questions can be also part of what you're learning right now. So feel free to um, bring that up here as well. Yes, Taisha, good morning. Yes, Taisha. Go ahead, Taisha. Yeah, good, good morning, everyone. I wanted to ask a question. Um, according to Genesis 26, and there was another reference as well that speaks about um, verse 7, and it says, and his sons, referring to, to um, Jacob, and his daughters with him, and his daughters and his and his son's daughters, and they brought him um, into Egypt. My question is, how many daughters did you, um, Jacob had? Because the Bible mentioned daughters. I know of one. Um, the scripture mentioned one before, but then clearly a name. But then it says daughters, which is a pure sense. And it's, there's another part in Genesis as well that mentioned daughters again. I'm trying to find it. But I just wanted um, some clarification if there's any, um, if you know, um, how many daughters does he really have? Okay, so the question is uh, how many daughters, but as per the reference that uh, Taisha mentioned, does Jacob have? Um, would anybody like to take the question? So I thought I just did a quick search. And uh, so the question is, how many daughters did Jacob have? Um, so Genesis 46 verse 15 says, his sons and daughters were 33. So that's a big number. Uh, 
Taisha? Uh, yes. The person, uh, the sons and daughters. Verse were 15. Oh, and the soul of his sons and daughters were thir 30 and th oh, 33. But um, so I guess we would have to divide the 12 <laughs> minus rather the 12. <laughs> so he had more daughters than sons? Seems like it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, didn't see that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you yeah. for that question. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, uh, opening it out again for questions that you could add in. You could also take some time to share what you've learned also if you feel there aren't questions, uh, any student would like to bring up something that you all have learned through the last week. It'll be helpful for each of us. Uh, yes, Taisha, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask, as it relates to counseling, right, I always want to, why, I know at some point you may have discussed it and I may have missed it. But um, I wanted to ask, because doing the quiz, um, it came up and I it was an observation. And um, why is it that in counseling, it is important that we we show empathy in, in, um, in, instead of being sympathetic? Because when things happen to people like, oh, and it, it, it's, it's nature. First, you start feeling some type of way um, for them. You start feeling sorry for them or, or something like that. But why is it, though, in counseling, it is not, is it that it's a rule? We, we should not do it. And we maintain some professionalism. Um, is it a given rule? That's my question. Or it's just to say you tend to understand how people feel, uh, how this may be, it may impact the individual, understand that the situation, but take feelings out of it. Okay, thank you, Taisha. So Taisha's question mm -hmm. was in counseling. Um, why is it that we use empathy and not sympathy? Um, so is that a rule or is that something that, uh, that is uh, very core to counseling? Um, yeah, maybe I'll take that question and then I'll open it out for anybody else who'd have some thoughts, uh, because I'm sure as pastors, we've all, uh, um, or as faculty or people in the ministry have dealt with, uh, uh, with, with people with struggles and difficulties. So empathy, uh, as it defines, it's, it is putting yourself in the shoes of, of another, where you are feeling as the other would feel. Whereas sympathy is one where you stand off from experiencing what the other person may be going through. Why is empathy important in counseling is as a person shares their difficulties or their challenges with you, they are also looking at, at, at someone entering into their own frame of understanding to look at the problem rather than looking at it as an outsider, like rather rather than you zooming out and looking at it as as a third person. In counseling, what you do or, or one of the processes of it is to feel as if a, a counselee may be feeling because it's only when you step into the shoes of somebody else are you able to really experience to some extent, maybe not in the degree that they have <clears throat> uh, the, the pain or the struggles that they're going through. So to be able to see it, see a situation or challenge from their point of view, rather than looking at it from your point of view. So sympathy generally is looking at it from uh, my own point of view, whereas empathy is looking at it, you're understanding their view of the problem in itself. And that's what um, engages uh, counsely in, in the process of counseling, where they experience that someone has understood them as the way that they wanted to be, they wish to be understood. 
and when that kind of um, uh, of a position is kept they are able to look forward to find solutions so in sympathy again when you play the role of sympathy you're probably giving suggestions and advice but when you when you're empathizing you're walking alongside with them to facilitate solutions on their own and that's what you want to do in counseling is not that a counselee depends on a counselor at all points of time but for them to be challenged to find out solutions to their problem and you walk alongside with them with empathy so that's the difference and yes in counseling you use empathy and not sympathy um i hope that answers your question uh, taisha if not i you know i could open it up for yeah. any of I the other clear. faculty i am clear thank you you've answered right. it thank you thank you taisha thank you uh yes paul Yes, Paul. You could go ahead and ask us your question. Yes, I want to learn about covenant hours. Praying during covenant hours. Uh, I think they are not biblical. They are not written in the Bible, but I have ever had uh, that emphasis being put that we should pray during covenant hours, and they say the covenant hours, both daytime and night time is three o'clock, 12 o'clock, nine o'clock, six o'clock, then nine in the night, midnight, three to six. So I want to learn about it. What is the secret of praying during these covenant hours? Thank or you, Paul. Do... Mm, yes, yes. Please go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, oh, because this is what is common in my country. <laughs> That's is the Bible school also aware about this covenant hours. So it is just something practiced in my country here only. Thank you. Mm. Paul, I, I would thank you for the question. Uh, I would just respond to the question in two ways. Uh, one is, you know, um, uh, I think this, I mean, this teaching on covenant hours is man-made and it's not biblical. You don't find it in the Bible, um, at least not in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, yes, you know, God instituted feasts. He instituted a day of the Sabbath, etc. cetera. Um, but this whole teaching on, you know, you pray at these certain hours is, is not biblical. You don't find any of that instruction in the New Testament. And I'll, I'll mention two things. One is, uh, when you come to John chapter 4, you know, um, the, the woman at the well asks Jesus, on which mountain should we worship? Right? So we could, we could create a new doctrine called covenant place or covenant mountain. You know, which mountain should I go up to? Right? Should I go up to this mountain or should I go up to that mountain? So, Jesus' response is very simple. You know, it's not about the mountain you go up to. You know, you don't worship God based on something in the natural. He says, the Father, you worship God in spirit and in truth. It has nothing to do with the covenant mountain. It has nothing to do with covenant hour. It has nothing to do with a particular place. You worship God in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeks such to worship him. Right? So that should settle once and for us, once and for all for us, that we can worship God the same way, 24 hours a day, uh, from any place, anywhere, right? Because we worship God or we pray in spirit and in truth. The second thing is, we must look at this as, you know, our covenant with God is something God instituted, God put in place. And the messenger of the covenant, or you could say the person who made this covenant, the Lord Jesus, is in heaven interceding for us 24-7. You know, he's, he's always there. So our prayers are not going to get to heaven in any better way, say to certain hours of the day, right? But uh, it's our high priest, our great high priest, is there all the time, all the time, 24-7. So what does it matter, right? Now, if you look at it very practically, it's a big joke because 
six o'clock in the morning in one part of the world is six o'clock in the evening in another part of the world, right? So if somebody says you have to pray uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, well, that's basically 24 hours a day because, you know, there's such a time difference. So it's not like, uh, so basically, if somebody is praying six o'clock in the morning, one part of the world, it's a different time in another part of the world. So this, you know, this whole teaching on covenant Ava doesn't, first of all, it's not biblical. A second, practically, it's a joke. I hope I answered the question. Sorry if I was a little sarcastic, but. <laughs> yes, yes, you answered. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Paul, for your question. Um, I think Charles has a follow-up question on covenant hours. If they can't be followed, then did God institute Sunday worship? Pastor, would you like to please take that question? Yeah. So, uh, you know, so Sunday worship was not instituted by God, but it was something that the church moved into subsequent to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what was instituted by God was the Sabbath, which was Saturday, the seventh day. God said, on this day you rest and you focus on worship. But then what are the what happened to the church? When the church was birthed, they got together on the first day of the week. And you see this in the book of Acts, which is Sunday. So God didn't tell them meet on the first day of the week. The church just moved into it. And then we've continued with it. Uh, what does the Bible teach? Colossians chapter 2, the Bible says, and also Romans chapter uh, 14. Uh, the day doesn't matter. So what does the scripture teach? The scripture teaches... Romans chapter 14, and also, what was the thing I said now? Uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2, uh, that we don't observe, we don't follow Sabbaths, or we don't observe days. Any day is fine. So, you know, in some part of the world, they worship on Sunday, many parts of the world. Some part of the world, the church worships on a Friday, especially in the Middle East, because that's their day off. Uh, in India, in our city, some churches, they meet on Tuesdays because majority of the people, they get their day off on Tuesday. So if you look at the church globally today, the church is actually worshiping on different days of the week, depending on where what is convenient to the people in that part of the world. It's because the Bible says, you know, uh, uh, we don't observe days. And then what did Jesus teach us? Even concerning the Sabbath, he said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the man is not obligated to the day, but the day is obligated to man. That means you use whichever day you want, right? So the day doesn't dictate, the day is not greater than the man. The man is greater than the day. And God has given us seven days a week. You use whatever day you want. You are more important than the day. Thank you, Pastor. Paul, I hope, um, Charles, I hope that answered your question. Okay. Uh, Jaya, you have uh, raised your hand. Would you like to unmute and ask us your question? Yes. Actually, uh, I also minister to people. And uh, what I find that uh, many places they are teaching about grace and all, and we just need to receive the blessing because he has made everything available on the cross. That is what is taught and that is what I see from the Bible. Again, in 1 Peter, he has put certain conditions. And that day I was um, uh, listening to uh, Pastor uh, Ashish Raiju's uh, sermon on James. There are certain conditions that you, these are the things that you need to live a godly life. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, he has clearly written that, uh, not verse 12, it's uh, 10. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and lips from speaking deceit and let him turn away from evil and do good. So like uh, there, I find it little uh, like if there is grace and then again, we are telling people that you need to in, uh, inherit blessings. You need to do good to inherit blessings. So like uh, how to teach them like they should not feel now that we are uh, uh, 
again binding them to law and rules and regulations and uh, when we are talking about unconditional grace and then again we are putting conditions okay thank you jay yeah yeah jay i think your question is uh, how do we uh, help people with the knowledge of grace as against observing the law and uh, yes. how how do we teach that okay um may i open this out to uh, to our pastors <coughs> um pastor jay kumar uh you on the call sorry no i don't think he's on the call yeah um yeah pastor yeah um, thank you jean yeah so uh, so grace as we know as we understand um is something that is unmerited something that we do not deserve that god gives us and grace mm-hmm. as we have studied it also means it's divine empowerment uh, also divine character uh, and uh, grace we know is uh, the 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 freely given gifts of god um, the charis um, the the gifts of god so um, grace involves all this but um, uh, yes god does give us Uh, uh we have access to salvation we have access to the blessings of god and it's purely by the grace of god because we don't have to perform anything to earn it right to to come to a place of saying that i have done this and therefore you know i'm in a better standing to you know to earn it um it is uh, given to us by by him um but what happens is when we do not walk in righteousness you know um, grace should actually grace actually empowers us to walk in righteousness when we do not when we walk according to the flesh when when our mind let's say is uh, when we are carnally minded as we see in in um, in in romans 8 we see that we are unable to um, let me just read that scripture um romans 8 um Uh, and verse five: For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God; it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So they, then, those who are in the flesh uh, cannot please God. uh and so on so we see that uh, uh when when our, when we are carnally minded then our actions are also carnal and uh, we are not in a place to uh we are not we are not uh, we are unable to please him right so these things actually block um uh you know uh, or, or take us or put us in a place of uh, not being able to receive from him right which is not what god wants uh for us so the though god is extending these things freely to us um but he expects us to to walk in grace to walk in righteousness to walk in holiness um uh to be able to uh, receive to be able to enjoy and and walk in it fully so so the things that you um uh shared the jaya the scripture that what we've been also learning on sundays uh, james is is something for us to walk out of that Uh, being empowered by grace so we're not saying that um, you know it is not given freely but then we are placing ourselves in a place where we we block ourselves from uh, from walking righteous we block ourselves from the goodness of god from receiving uh, the grace of god and that is um, that is so very true right so um, yeah yes jean uh, would you like to add thank you. anyone else like to yeah, add thank also thank you Thank you, Pastor Jaykumar. Is there anyone else who'd like to add uh, any I, other thoughts? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Pastor Jaykumar, and thank you, Jean. Uh, I just want to share one scripture. I think that also can help us. It's a uh, one John, uh, uh, sorry, John one and uh, verse fourteen. It talks about Jesus. It says that uh, the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So uh, I just want to. Um, Uh, you know point out here that even when you see the person of the lord jesus there is grace but that does not encourage us to cover up the truth and you know uh, vice versa it goes together grace and truth 
go together. So for us to, uh, as Pastor Jay Kumar said, uh, empowered by grace to live a righteous life, um, uh, it, it, you know, that that's how it is meant to be. God wants us to walk in his grace and to also walk in his truth. So I just wanted to add that, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Jay, I hope that uh, answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. All right. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, one last question. I think we have time just to uh, take this quickly. Um, Zillatoli's question, I have observed many times during house visitations, people sharing, uh, people sharing that to pray for them because they have a short life. Uh, they say some spiritual leaders whom they look up, prophecy over them, uh, just want some inputs how to minister to them because they fear and ask for prayer. Even if we try explaining uh, to them that, that they, but they're still stuck with the prophecy. So uh, Zilatoli, I suppose what you're asking is that when people ask for prayer, someone prophecies over them uh, about, about their health or about something. And when you go to minister to them, they are um, quite strong in, they, they stay put on the prophecy that's over them. I, I understand that's your question and yeah okay yes, ma'am so okay so how how should we how should we meet someone who is sick and unwell yes I'm opening this out uh, to 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 our faculty uh, Pastor Roshan would you like to take up that question yeah I, yeah sure um, I mean um, I think we share with them what God's word says about his heart for his people. So I think time and time again, seeing the Bible that um, I mean, at least in Roshan, the, sorry, we're not able to hear you too well. Uh, just a little closer to the mic, a little louder. Sorry, Jean, let me just check the connection. My voice, my volume is maxed out. Uh, maybe just just to speak up a bit, and I think we'll be able to hear you. Okay. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Uh, yes, you are. Okay. Right. So uh, I think we just uh, share with them about what the really uh, the Bible says, uh, I and mean, what God's heart for people uh, is, and uh, you know, in Genesis. I think uh, one of the scriptures that says, uh, "His days shall be 120 years," and uh, the Psalm that says, "With long life I will satisfy him." Um, so we encourage uh, those who we go to minister to, saying that, hey, this is what God's heart uh, is. Uh, am I still audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's my, uh, that, that would be, you know, what I would tell them. But, yeah, if anybody else could add to that. Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Roshan. Uh, I'd just like to add just one, uh, especially Ziltoli on what you said, how do you minister? And, and we go back to James 5.14 on that. Um, and I'll just read that for you. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So I think there's a, uh, there is a, pretty clear direction of how we can minister there. A couple of things. Um, you call for the elders of the church, pray for him, anoint him, and the prayer of the uh, of the faith will save the sick. So uh, that that is one, that is a way that you, you minister to them as written in scripture. I, I know there are many more um, points that we may have, uh, but we've run out of time. Um, uh, is is there anyone else who'd like to quickly bring up any anything further to Jaya's question? Yes, yeah, just one one verse, and then um, it's one Corinthians fourteen, and uh, you know, uh, this is specific to prophecy. One Corinthians fourteen and uh, verse three, right? It says, "He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men." 
and he who um, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edification uh, edifies the church. So we know that uh, prophecy, which is the, the 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 quickened word of God, which is spoken forth, uh, brings edification, exhortation, and comfort, and uh, not to stir up fear, uh, and not to put people in um, you know in a place of fear and unable to do anything. So that's prophecy, and and the, uh, and the other thing also is that we are called to. Um, Test every every prophetic word. Um, test if it is in line with the ways of God. It is in line with the word of God, and if it's in line with the the, the principles, that can, uh, you know, um, governing prophecy itself. How prophecy is to be delivered. How prophecy is to be received. So, so therefore, um, so the person should not just swallow everything, you know, take everything and then um, live in fear, but really take it and test it. And uh, no matter uh, who the person is who has prophesied, test it. And then um, if it is, if it, uh, if it's valid uh, with the word of God, then, uh, you know, receive it and live according to it. So it's, it's not to create fear, but prophecy brings edification, exhortation and comfort to men. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining in today for our mentoring hour. Uh, we will close. May I request one of the students to close with prayer? Uh, Anita or Rupa, would any of you like to um, just close with a word of prayer, please? Okay, Pastor, thank you. Father, thank you for this mentoring hour. Thank you for your presence and your wisdom that you have placed in your servants, Lord. You have clear our doubts and strengthen us, um, Father, in your word, Father, and reinstating us in your truth, Master. We thank and praise you, Father. Fill us with more of your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we may be rooted in your word, Lord God. Thank you for this time of strengthening Father, we commit ourselves and this day into your loving hands. Be thou our guide and strength, our master and leader. We believe in your leadership, your authority over our lives. Into your loving hands, we commit ourselves in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you all for joining in. Have a blessed day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.